everyone on there, good afternoon. Welcome to the Graduate Attribute Modules Roundtable. For those of you who haven't had the opportunity to meet directly yet, my name is Tammy Bowie and I'm your current Lambda Campus President. And I'll be chairing the... Apologies for that, I'm just getting a phone call from someone. <laughs> I'll be chairing the Roundtable today. From... Good afternoon, welcome to the Graduate Attribute Modules Roundtable. We're having some technical issues today, apparently. We love to see it. Uh, from my work with many of you this academic year, the most common request is that you, as students, have the opportunity to question the senior development team for the graduate attribute modules and hear their responses directly. The roundtable has been organised to give you this opportunity. We're going to run through some general housekeeping. We're running this session through Teams Live, which means a couple of things. Firstly, you won't be able to unmute yourselves or turn on your cameras. But this does give us a live Q&A function so you can ask questions in real time. The reason that we've settled on this type of event is to ensure I don't miss anyone um, or anyone's questions in the chat or leave anyone with a raised hand. You'll have the opportunity to like the questions that come through, so show your support for the ones that you want to see answered. We also ask you to submit questions in advance. This is so the most commonly asked questions from the advanced submission can be asked first during this event. And if your question's course specific, we can get back to you with a response directly. Many of you did submit your questions anonymously, so we won't be able to get back to you directly um, in those cases. But we wanted to give you a general response. So the questions specifically that we're going to be asking today haven't been given to the staff in advance. Um, but we did provide them with a list of themes so that they could prepare any data or information they may need to answer your question in full. That said, if we have had many advanced questions on the same topic, I will be adjusting the phrasing of those to kind of address them en masse. So please don't be worried if the way that I ask your question isn't word for word your original submission. If you want something clarified for any reason, um, please don't hesitate to use the Q&A function as the SU team will be monitoring that to make sure I don't miss anything. I fully expect us to have a lot of questions submitted for the staff here today, and we're aware that we might not be able to get through it all during the actual session itself, but the university have committed to answering all of your questions in full and writing after the event. This will be available to you through the SU website, but please bear with us as we aim to get it to you in the next couple of weeks. That's going to be impacted on how many questions that we've had come in. We've grouped the questions thematically so we can move through them in a logical way and maximise the amount of content that we can cover during the event. We'll also be recording this session so that you can, we can share it with all the students that weren't able to join us here today. If you would like to use closed captions, you can access them from the bottom of your screen. You'll be looking for a small box with CC in it. And that should wrap up the housekeeping. So we're going to have a very quick round of introductions. So if I can ask Dylan and Barry to introduce themselves. Dylan, if we can start with you, then Barry. Yes, by all means. Good afternoon, Tammy and everybody. Um, I'm Dylan Jones. I'm currently the Deputy Vice Chancellor at the University and perhaps if I share with you some, some background. Before I joined uh, the university about five years ago, I was a head teacher of an all through school uh, and prior to that, a, a teacher of history. So my background is in, in the humanities. Joined the university as, as a uh, Dean of Education and then now, uh, as I said, Deputy Vice Chancellor. So Barry and I are part of, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, the oversight group who, who are looking uh, are working with the Programme Development Board, which is Christine, Rianne and, and Maggie and others here. So, so our role is, is a, an oversight role within uh, the development of the modules. Diolch, Brownda, Barry, it's Barry Lyles. I have a dual role within the University, that of Pro Vice Chancellor for Skills and Lifelong Learning. I also head up the Institute of Science and Art. Um, Following on from Dylan there, my early career was that of engineering. I entered education teaching engineering and spent the last 35 plus years in further and higher education. Um, up to three years ago, I was principal of two colleges, College Sirgar and College Heredigion, which are part of the group structure, um, before moving into this particular role. <coughs> I don't wish to extend it in any way, but just for you perhaps um, help in terms of my thinking for the last 11 years, I have been a board member of World Skills UK, which develops the skills of young people in our nation through the use of skills competitions. 
Thank you. As members of the Programme Development Board, we will also introduce ourselves, I think, as well. Um, hello, all. My name is uh, Christine, Christine uh, Jones. Um, I'm chair of the Programme Development Board. I'm also interim head of the Institute of Education and Humanities. My background is also in humanities in that I took a Welsh degree and a PhD at, at Lampeter. Um, and following teacher training, I returned to Lampeter and taught for many years at Lampeter. See, there's a slight echo here. There we are. Um, Sammy for that. Um, uh, following that, I then moved to uh, Camarin and I uh, took on the role of Assistant Dean of Quality. Apologies, I know there is still is some sort of an echo that I can hear. I, I don't know, Tammy, is this affecting um, in general? No? Nope. Oh, well, I, I can live with the echo then as long as uh, it's just me, that's fine. Uh, no, don't worry about that. Um, so I took on the role of assistant dean in um, 2015, um, and um, that, that, that this is my main role now. But for the year, as I say, I'm um, undertaking the role of interim head of uh, humanities and education. But I also continue with my PhD students in Welsh. I'll turn to Maggie and Rian for a quick resume. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Maggie Inman. I'm the Assistant Dean of the Institute of Management and Health. And for those of you who uh, don't know what we do there, we cover programmes obviously in business and management and health, but we also cover programmes to do with sport, policing, um, sustainability, a whole range of programmes within our Institute. Um, and like the others, um, a bit of a varied background. Before that, I was head of the business school here and I came into higher education to teach, um, to lecture about human resource management because um, prior to that, I worked in industry in Australia, Japan, London, Wales, everywhere in human resource management. So, um, um, yeah, I love my job. I think it's it's great that um, students like you are really interested in how we develop curriculum and, um, and want to be part of this process. So welcome. Afternoon, everybody. My name is Rian Paul. I'm the Assistant Dean Quality for the Wales Institute of Science and Art. Um, I've been in the role since 2014. Um, prior to that, I was lecturing in computing. That is my background, what I did my degree in. But prior to that, I ha actually had a career as an environmental surveyor, going out on site, gathering samples all over the country. So it was a pretty interesting role before I came to the university, but chose to come um, because I wanted to study computing, which I did at the university, and then never left and continued with lecturing. So that, I think that's me. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you all. Uh, now we're done with the intros and the general housekeeping, we're going to jump straight in with the Q&A. So as I said, we've broken these questions down um, thematically. So the first theme that we're going to talk about is consultation. So the first question that we had from pre-submission was, who was consulted about the creation of the modules? What employers, industries and lecturers? If I, if I just kick off perhaps and then and colleagues can, can come in. Um, Within the university, there was a, a, a process of consultation via uh, the Senate, uh, and the Senate is the academic decision making body within the university, which includes representatives um, across the university and, of course, uh, from the SU. Uh, and then there was extensive consultation with both staff and students as part of that process um, before we, we took the decision to introduce the modules. There was a widespread consultation as well with uh, employers and perhaps Barry might wish to outline yep. a little more of that and then uh, colleagues in, in, uh, outline how the consultation worked with both students and, and staff one uh, as part of the Senate decision making process. Yeah, I'll certainly pick up the employers if I can because we took the approach um, naturally that students progress. We are a stepping stone as a university progression from education into employment. Yes. But we consulted with a broad range of employers in each of the sectors supported by the university. 
and we approach them through the regional learning and skills partnerships where there are subgroups of each of the key sectors uh, which are important to the Welsh economy. So we made a direct approach uh, to employers. Uh, in fact, very, very interesting because, you know, that did influence our direction of travel with the impact that the uh, uh, pandemic was having on employment at that very early stage. Um, beyond that consultation of uh, directly with employers, we all obviously consulted as well with um, local government, Welsh government and UK government in terms of the data emerging as we were developing the actual graduate attributes. The consultation with the Students Union, um, probably Christine, you know more than I perhaps on that issue. Yes, certainly, Barry. Yes, um, we set up, like I say, the Programme Development Board, which is the operational board, um, which consists of members from all units in the institution. And it also in, in, includes the, the, the SU on that. Um, and therefore, um, as part of that, the student consultation was uh, was arranged through the through the SU. Um, which, as I say, the uh, chief executive of the SU, SU is uh, a member of the board and uh, various meetings were held um, throughout the summer with through using the student voice uh, leads. And uh, there was also opportunities for individuals to uh, join the programme teams. Sign off um, of the modules um, in was approved, of course, by an external advisor, but they also were signed off by the SU before delivery. This was all part of the approval process and all part of the, the, the consultation process uh, in, in, in that uh, sense. Um, and it was also recognised that um, ongoing consultation was part and parcel of the process. We recognise that these happen throughout the summer and therefore the ongoing consultation, the whole point of this was to enable those undertaking the modules, those who had heard about the modules, to take part in the focus groups, um, which also occurred during, the, uh, during November and December. And throughout this time, information came back to the Programme Development Board um, in terms of feedback um, and ways forward and these individuals then worked with the project manager um, on any student comments that had come back and so forth. And I, I think perhaps Rian and Maggie uh, can come in there, uh, as there's enough of my voice for now. Uh, would you like to come in as well as members of the board? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, uh, before we um, create um, any programme of study or modules, we always do consultate, com consult because we, we want to be sure that they're going to be relevant um, and so that was normal procedure to do that but I think for these modules more than any um, in my memory anyway we consulted more extensively than we have before um, so for example we had over 50 staff involved in the creation of these modules all voluntary um, we asked for volunteers and, and we were delighted that so many wanted to volunteer um, because we have such a range of expertise across the university and that was the same for students as well. We had, um, as material was produced, we trialled it out on students, taken from across the university again to see how it worked, was it worked, was it what, what wasn't working, and we're trying to tweak it in the development stage before it was rolled out live. Yeah, don't know if Ria wants to add anything there. And all I would add is in terms of the staff members, they come from subject areas all across the university. So every institute was represented and the subject areas from within them was represented to make sure that we weren't missing any particular area so that everybody had the opportunity to input into those um, the development of the modules to make sure that all subject areas were catered for within them. I don't know if that answers the question, Tammy, for you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Just waiting for. There we go. Awesome. Thank you. Um, kind of following on from those consultations, um, we've had some questions in around which students specifically were consulted. So specifically, which campuses were represented and which levels were reviewing the content? I think again, Christina and, and colleagues, uh, you have the detail for that. The intention was to have 
uh, all campuses uh, and and all students represented in the consultation. That was the intention, definitely. Mm, yeah, I. I I can co I can confirm uh, confirm what has just been said by by, by Dylan. Um, all campuses were were involved in the same way that all staff um, had opportunities to be involved. Likewise, um, students. The importance being to cover a range of discipline areas and to cover some who would be uh, undertaking the modules, but also others who, who would be going on maybe to employment earlier than, than, than those starting on the modules and so forth. And so there was a wide range like that across all areas um, were uh, asked would, would they like to, to, to participate. And in some areas you may have more than others, but the whole point of the consultation, as I, as I stressed earlier, is that it, it, it's a continuous process. So if, if certain students weren't available at certain times, others were, were had this opportunity at another time for reflection and feedback. It, 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 consultation is inbuilt into the um, creation, I think, from the very, very, very start. And that's among staff and uh, among students. And, and I do with the levels, the, again, the intention was that uh, the, a variety of levels were, were, um, were represented in the consultation. Uh, it, it was an invite and, and for, for students to volunteer, but I think the intention and I think all levels were represented in the consultation, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, in the ongoing process. And I should also add on that point that we also asked specifically for Welsh medium students, for the Welsh medium clusters as well, um, to take <coughs> part, and, and certain students did. It'll be perhaps worthwhile mentioning at this stage, beyond the, because we've majored really now on the initial consultation, what I've been impressed with is the level of consultation beyond that as we've reviewed post delivery of the first module. We were always aware that, you know, these were developed for September uh, 2020. We then um, delivered them, but there's been a significant review of that delivery, which has um, resulted in, in a lot of development and amendment. But it's key then that we've taken on board that student voice. And I, I'm so grateful to uh, all members of the Students' Union who facilitated that for us, in fact. Um, so th that was facilitated by the Students' Union to, uh, to gather that opinions um, on an ongoing basis. OK, brilliant. Thank you. So. I'm conscious that we've got quite a lot of content to get through today, so we're going to move on to theme two. Uh, this is around timing of the rollout of these modules. So the original question was, were these modules introduced due to the impact of COVID on the higher education sector? If so, why is there a record of the university saying these modules were in the works for implementation prior to the pandemic? Uh, Dylan, if I can send this one your way. Yes, sorry, can you repeat the second question? I, I, I didn't quite hear it, my apologies. Yeah, no problem at all. If so, why is there record of the university saying that these modules were in the works for implementation prior to the pandemic? Um, I'm not aware of the latter, so I, I will have to come back to you on that one. I'm, I'm not uh, aware of that being the case, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that, we'll, we'll check that. If I just go through the, the, the timeline, um, for you, uh, the COVID pandemic, as you as you were aware, has impacted uh, a number of well, all our lives in, in different ways, and it has accelerated also a number of developments. Um, you'll be aware also when you, if if students and colleagues haven't seen on our strategic plan on, on the website, uh, one of our values is employability and creativity, and in the strategic objective one. Uh, we do declare clearly that our aim is to develop programmes which develop skills and employability for our graduates. So within that content uh, and context, uh, uh, apologies, we were aware that the cor coronavirus pandemic was speeding up developments and changing and accelerating the digital revolution. We felt within that um, value that we uh, include within our strategic plan that we needed to respond in line with a number of other universities. And that, that was our response and our discussion within Senate in, in, in spring of last year to make sure that we were able to, to respond uh, 
uh, and to be able to develop uh, these graduate attribute models because we wanted to make sure that our graduates were best placed to respond to the to respond to the new normal and the new context within uh, the employability and within the uh, outside university and beyond the university. So that was the, the motivation there at that time. So in a sense, when you refer to during the pandemic, we wanted to be agile and put our students in the best possible place when the pandemic was coming to an end. And also the university, we, we didn't feel that we were able to justify our value by standing still. Uh, so we had to respond. And one of the natures and strengths of the university is being able to move quickly to respond with a view to making sure that we are true to the values of employability and creativity. So I don't know, Barry, if you want to add anything to that? Or? Yes, obviously, because these were commissioned and developed during uh, the height of the pandemic. We were also made aware of from the various health boards about uh, the prospect of a second wave. Uh, we didn't realise at the time the enormity of that particular second wave, but what's important is as well that we were guided by history. Uh, the, the fact is we were aware of what happened to um, our graduates in the 2008 recession and in fact as far back as the early 1900s, 1990s I should say, not 1900s, um, on the basis of... Showed his age there, I think. Absolutely, yes, I, I was there. Uh, the, the situation will be, and you know, we worked very, very closely with the Resolution Foundation, who've identified it's not the impact during the actual pandemic, it's the economic impact post the pandemic, and that's what we were guided by. We know full well in terms of what will be the impact on the employment prospect of graduates going forward, not for this year or next year, for the next five years. We've got evidence to prove that in the 2008 recession, graduates who graduated in the three years post-2008 are still today worse off financially than their counterparts who graduated before. A number are still unemployed as a result of it. Now, we were guided, therefore, by a wealth of knowledge from previous recessions, but none of those matched up to what is going to happen as a result of this pandemic. And that was at all times our guiding principles, mm, mm, mm. we have a duty to protect our students. We have a duty to prepare them for the world of work beyond their time with us. And that's what was our driving force behind this development. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to move on to the next one there. Can I, uh, before you do so, Tommy, my apologies, we'll come back with that, that second question. Um, as I said, we, you've, you've outlined at the beginning, we shall come back to uh, questions that we feel that we need to add more to. So we shall do so uh, after this uh, call, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. That's not a problem. Thank you. So the next question that we have was, given the delays in producing finished content for the modules and allocating sufficient time for lecturers to tailor the modules to their relevant disciplines, why was their impl implementation not postponed until next year to prevent the issues that we've encountered as a result as a direct result of rushed and incomplete content. Christine and the board, if I can send this your way. More than more than happy to answer, but I think the, the um, general background would be useful in this top context, possibly from uh, Barry, because I think it follows on from the other question and then we'll come into the detail by all means. Yes, absolutely. Very much. And thank you, Christine. Um, the issue we had here, Tammy, from day one was we made that conscious decision that we knew that the immediate impact would be on the current students mm. within the university. We did. We know full well that those graduating in 2021 in particular, i.e. the first year of those studying the graduate attributes, would be at, its, at the greatest height of the outcome of the pandemic. So what we've decided to do, we'd, we decided not to, in fact, simply protect those in our third year this year, we wanted to protect our entire student population. So I termed it at the time the big bang. We had to be fair and provide parity for all. And that's the situation we found ourselves in. Now, yes, that provided us with a burden because we had to develop at, at, at a, a fast pace all the materials for the September delivery in each of the year groups. But we didn't want to actually protect one year group at the expense of the others. We wanted to provide a parity for all. 
Now, what we have been able to do, obviously, is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've reviewed that material. We're investing heavily with external support to actually improve them. So this will be a process of continual improvement, as is the case with all um, material we develop. But this was quite acute because of the nature of it. We had to get the protection for those graduate in this year, as in fact we did our greatest assistance for those graduate last year who didn't do the graduate attributes, but there were other strategies we put in place in terms of support there, like the use of IT equipment and, and so forth. If, if I may add, Tommy, before Christine comes in, I, I, I just picking up a slight point that Maggie made earlier on. Uh, in my short time here, I, I'm not aware of modules being the focus, so so much focus across the university by so many people to make sure that we get it as right as we could. And I think that the constant review is, in, is an example of that. And I, I don't think there have been any other modules about the same focus, the same input and continuous input uh, as there have been with these modules. And that includes uh, colleagues in, in the further education college, uh, colleges in our group. So I think that the, the, the scrutiny on, on, on this has been more than any other model I'm aware of in my short space of time, but Christine and Maggie and Ian have been longer than I, maybe they, they may be able to reflect on that comment, but I think the focus has been significant. I did, I, Tammy, I, I, I'd endorse, I'd endorse both comments there, um, both by those by Barry and those by Dylan in terms of, of, of the focus on the review. <laughs> Um, but I think it, it we go back in a way to a, a previous comment as well, where we where we stressed about the um, the the volunteers, if you like, amongst the staff. I think that is indicative of the staff, the of the feeling amongst staff that these modules, as has been noted already, were actually acutely needed and needed by all students um, across um, all campuses. Hence the the willingness amongst staff, as I say, over 50 took part in the writing teams. There are also other individuals who, who took part in, in, in specialist roles um, and also linked with, with, with external bodies who also took part in this because they felt, as did we all, that, that it was important, as I say, to, to offer these modules to students in all year groups and to offer it now um, when 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 things were, were particularly acute and developing for the future, recognizing also, as I say, that this would be continuous consultation and um, and and review, as there would be in other modules, but not as as has been said to the same to the same degree. Thank you. Um, I'm very conscious of the time, so we're going to just kind of move on a little bit. But okay. as I said, during the housekeeping section, all of these questions will be answered in full after the event. Yes. So if you want yeah. more detail on this, there'll be space um, there for you, for you yeah. to I'm... add in your thoughts there. The next theme that we're going to move on to is around the CMA. So we've had some questions come through around consumer rights and the CMA. How has the university approached these modules with this as a consideration? Again, we, we, we'll, we'll turn to colleagues for detail, but uh, our understanding is that we've followed the CMA guidance uh, in an appropriate way. Uh, and that was the advice that we sought. And that's what the, the advice that we, we followed. So our understanding is that we, we did check, obviously, and we, we had confirmation and advice shared with us that we the approach we were taking uh, was uh, in line with that guidance, um, which including the way that we uh, consulted and the timeline that we undertook, given uh, as barriers as decided we wanted to make sure that we all benefited uh, from this development. But uh, this we did check obviously, and, and as we did with all of the developments. So the CMI guidance, as we understand it, we did follow appropriately. I don't know whether anybody else would like to, to add. It, it is within reasonable timescales mm -hmm. and it is and it'll be re on record in one of the meetings of either senior directorate or senate where this question was assured we went through our academic office who queried mm -hmm. it um, and that led then to the development of information sessions which included some video preparations um, and advice and guidance but then on by letters which went out to existing students on that basis mm -hmm. now naturally the timescale um, was 
tight by, 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 by nature. You know, we, are, we were planning this, as you say, in May, June, it approved in June, the development over uh, June, July and August, and we were delivering at the end of September, so by nature. But we felt strongly on legal advice that we were conforming to the requirements of the CMA. Thank you. I'm just going to take a brief break from the Q&A. Um, unfortunately, I've just been informed that the Q&A function isn't working properly. So what we've done is created a Mentimeter that students can access through www.menti.com and you can submit questions through there. To access the right submission, you'll need the code 15857794. Eight, and then I'll have access to your questions through that. The passcode and things is going to be shared on our socials. So if you're a part of the campus pages, please double check there if you need another copy of that. I am incredibly sorry for the technical problems that we've had today. We're going to move on to the next theme, which is around notice of the modules. So many students feel that the university didn't disclose the introduction of the modules early enough. The university states there was a letter that was sent to all students about their introduction, but many students don't seem to have received that letter. In addition to the delay in informing students of their introduction, there was very little information on what format these modules were going to take and how they would impact wider courses. Many students feel trapped in a timetable that they didn't agree to, particularly our first year students who are new to our institution. Students are asking if the university will admit that this was poorly handled and offer an apology. Um, I think we're we're going to have to refer to our early comments. We, we as, as Barry has mentioned, we, we recognise it was a tight schedule. We recognise there was uh, an imperative for us to ensure that all students had the uh, um, opportunity. I want to make sure that all our, our students benefited from the graduate attribute modules. As as we've said, stated before, we did uh, follow guidance on the CMA. And also, we ensured that we we communicated uh, to students as we uh, as appropriately. So, um, I'm disappointed to hear that students feel that they weren't communicated with. But we did follow due process and and make sure that we 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 did communicate to students. It was a tight timeline, as Barry says, but I think we we felt it, what the procedures we were following were appropriate, uh, and in within the context of making sure that we wanted everybody to benefit. To, benefit from these modules in September. I don't know whether colleagues who were involved in the actual detail of that process would, would like to add to that. The only thing I'd like to add before my colleague come in perhaps is that you have to consider how we manage all of the modules and effectively this is no different. You know, those turning up for level four would have received the same information regarding module XYZ as they would have for these. So they were dealt with in the same manner in that respect. Um, the change, as I said, we did intimate through uh, and apply through letter. Um, we also took great strides in terms of staff development for those delivering the modules mm -hmm. to be aware of why we're doing them and the benefits that we would provide to our students. Now, that therefore would have to come across in the individual introductions which were prepared for the modules, as they would for any other module. Thank you. I'm going to move on to the next one. Again, I am very conscious of the time. Um, there was a significant delay in updating the university website to represent these modules as part of the courses that are offered to our pr prospective students. Why was this delay so significant when we've been taking these modules since September? And how would the university respond to accusations that this is false advertising? I would have to, uh, sorry, come in. Sorry, but the only thing I'd say that I'm like, disappointed if it was perceived as being false advertising, because that certainly is not the situation. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm conscious I'm repeating myself here. What we want to do is to give the best opportunity for our students. Now I will say, and I will accept uh, the criticism of the updating of the website. Um, however, and this is not an excuse by any means, one should take into recognition the enormity of the tasks undertaken by the university to protect our students and our staff during unprecedented times. None of our procedures or systems 
were designed for delivery within a, a world pandemic. So can you imagine what we've had to do, you know, from changing every aspect of our delivery? And our priority at all times has been the health and safety of our students. Mm. And on that basis, therefore, yep, we'll take it on the chin. We may not have delivered in some areas as we would have under our normal mode of delivery. But I will stress, we are dealing with a pandemic. Mm. And I'm particularly proud of the way that this, this university, and as an employee of the university, how I feel protected, and how all the students I've spoken to also feel protected by that basis. So our priority has been on managing our delivery in the pandemic, which may well have allowed us to look at other issues such as the website updating may have slipped a little bit. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we're going to move on to the next theme, which is around contact hours. So the question reads, due to the reduced contact hours as a part of this module in comparison to other modules, many students feel as if they're having to teach themselves a significant portion of the content and have become increasingly reliant on PowerPoint presentations as opposed to content being delivered by a lecturer. Why is this the case? Before I hand over to colleagues about the detail that I and Dylan haven't got, um, but can I just remind ourselves once again of the situation we found ourselves in late spring, early summer, we were being warned by government of a second wave. We were being warned that we would not be on campus and that proved to be right. So we were developing material that could be delivered 24-7 asynchronously without damaging our learning for our students. And that was a key factor which we took into consideration on that basis. So yes, whilst there isn't a lecture directly in front of a classroom, we have invested significantly in the resources behind it to permit that uh, asynchronous delivery. The detail of the hours, I'll turn to. Is it Rianne, you've got the detail on the hours? Um, to be honest, it's, it's all, all of us in that the module is designed to have um, it's 200 hours for a 20 credit module and contact would always be 48 hours. So the material was developed on that basis and with the idea that there would be 16 hours of it face to face either in the class, but primarily online so that it was um, that we could still deliver that content in that second wave. So it was the 16 hours of contextualized material specific to the subject areas for each um, program that um, was studying the modules. Mm. Uh, can I come in there as well, Tammy? Following on from that, um, I would also say that um, this learning online, this independent learning uh, is uh, is an important means of encouraging, uh, encouraging sort of thinking on one's own flexibility as well. And, and there again, um, the design of the modules came into this as well in that they were bite sized units um, because that enabled individuals to fit their learning as well around the wider needs, which was particularly relevant in times of lockdown and other responsibilities as well, so that these bite sized sessions um, supported uh, the learning in a different way to, to some of the other modules, but equally so to to strengthen the opportunities available to students. Yeah, yeah. And if I just just building on that um, and back to Barry's point, you know, these were these are unprecedented times and we knew our students wouldn't be able to study in the same way as normal. And so thinking about our student body where a high percentage are mature students which have who obviously have family responsibilities, you no know, children at home. They couldn't we knew they couldn't attend face to face at specific times. So we ha we wanted to create something that allowed them some flexibility to build around their other modules and by doing um, having these modules, it allowed that. So, for example, in, in my institute, we have a lot of students who work in the care sector. And so they were working around the clock dealing with this pandemic, but we didn't want them to have to penalise their studies or at the expense of their studies. And so that was part of the reason as well. It was deliberate that there wasn't going to be as much real time face to face so that we could accommodate everybody's situation as much as possible. Thank you. 
that actually leads quite nicely into our next section and our next question with the theme around content. So the first question is, these modules were introduced to provide students with skills to aid their future employability. How will mature students consider in this decision where in many cases they have experience in their chosen field and have come to study course specific skills to further their employment? Again, uh, colleagues can come into it, but as, as a general response um, to the design of of the of the programs, the the element of the core content was contextualization was a key element of of where what we're developing. So we shouldn't see, be seeing that the graduate uh, attributes and subject content are an either or or totally separate. There is that contextualization within the graduate attribute modules which contributes and is based on that subject content so they're not they're not separated in that sense but i just would add and i'll allow colleagues to come in on on that specific question that you, that you mentioned but if i could add from a personal point of view and, and barry maybe come into come into this and and maggie with a hr uh, background when appointing and and when interviewing for posts and i've done so hundreds of them Often you get people presented for you for interview who have the same subject knowledge. What you're looking at in, in that uh, appointment process are those personal attributes which differentiate one candidate from another, and that's crucial. So I wouldn't necessarily dismiss uh, that element out of hand. I think it's an important element of that employability process. And just to re-emphasize, re it is not graduate modules, uh, graduate attribute modules and then subject content. There is a marriage between the two and there is an overlap and there is that contextualization within that. I don't know whether colleagues want to come in specifically on the mature students element. To, to me as well, we have to take into consideration. We know now that in Wales, unemployment is up to 4.8%. We are targeting 600,000 young people uh, being unemployed. What is going to happen as a result of not only the pandemic, but the rapidly changing technology applications of things like artificial intelligence and automation, which had been brought forward by the pandemic, is there is significant unemployment. What our graduates will face, therefore, are skilled people, older, mature people, with a broader range of skills in competition for employment. And hence why we did decide upon the three areas of employability digital and lifelong learning in order to give our students the best opportunity against what will be particularly stiff competition. Now, therefore, when we have individuals, as Dylan mentioned, and as, as I've interviewed, when you have two individuals with equal subject knowledge, we have to provide an advantage and that's what we feel we are providing with the graduate attributes is that additional advantage to secure employment. Can I Perhaps. just jump in there, sorry. Of course, um, yeah. We had an employer, Jessica, who came and attended one of our events and spoke on behalf of her company, Younger Solutions. And that's one of the things she said. She wasn't concerned about what degree somebody had. She didn't care about the subject area specifically, but what she was looking for was those transferable skills to make sure that people could work straight away in her business. So it's about taking the person who, yes, they may have um, experience in, in industry already, but it's developing those attributes to make sure that they are at the forefront of their particular area and can then do the job that she needed. Tommy, would it be an opportunity, I don't know what the, the next theme is, but if I can go back to that subject con content element, which, which Ria has emphasised, maybe Christina's going to come in. I think there is this seemingly uh, misunderstanding about the contextualization within the graduate modules. Perhaps it's an opportunity now just to, to highlight that uh, more, uh, if that's OK with you, Tammy. I think that actually kind of ties in quite well with the next question. So okay. if I ask that and then hand straight over to you, Dylan. Yes, by all means. Um, so the next questions around the content um, highlight that the content's equivalent to the work expected of students in further education, being at a level lower than that that's expected at foundation, things like origami bird activities and things like that, for example. Um, how did the university respond to complaints about this content being patronising and condescending to students? 
And Dylan, I think that ties in with the contextualization stuff that you wanted to touch on. Yes, fine, Tammy. It's just, just as a general uh, point and to re-emphasize what we said at the outset, uh, and Barry in particular emphasized, there's an ongoing consultation process. We, we, we didn't just consult pre-development of the modules. There is an ongoing process and they've been changed and amended and developed in readiness for semester two and, and so on. So there has been that consistent change. So, so to answer in general terms, we have responded to observations, criticisms in relation to the levels of, of the material where well, they've been developed by staff, those 50 staff and more across to, to the university. So the staff there felt that the levels were appropriate, but that doesn't say that we shall, we shall not review or consider how we might improve that, as anybody would do in any programme on an annual basis in any event. So they fit in with that. They're not set in stone in that sense, but we want to make sure that they're the best possible. And that consistent review and discussing and consulting is part of that process. But if I can then transfer to the Maggie, Triana and Christine, who are more involved with that detail than I am, please. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, we, there was never the intention for content to uh, to be patronising. So I'm, I'm sorry that if some of you did feel that. Um, as um, an HR manager, I used to run a lot of development centres with employers and senior managers, and we used to do exercises like the origami, but it wasn't about the actual exercise, it was about the application and the critical nature of it and what you can apply for it. But having said that, we've taken your um, that feedback on board, we've removed the origami, Screen, OK, so that we have removed that because we understand it was quite contentious, but um, the purpose behind it was about application, as were the purpose of all these modules about contemporary challenges, problem solving and all the skills that employers want, whatever your age, because you were in this pandemic that no one had predicted or very few people had predicted. And so it's about dealing with things that we can't predict. And so some of these exercises were trying to, to develop those skills and those abilities to deal with the unexpected, things that you would never come across in normal circumstances. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I'm sorry if you did feel it was patronised, that was never our intention, but we are listening to your feedback and, um, mm -hmm. and hopefully, I hope going forward, the application has become more obvious why some of the activities, and um, what the purpose of some of those activities are, so you can see the link better and I think that's probably some of the contextualization as well and for yourselves as students you know if you don't understand why you're doing an, an exercise bring that up you know ask yes. ask your tutor you know why did we do this you know what's the application and that's where the contextualization can help as well so mm -hmm. we encourage you to you know give us that feedback but also in real time when you're speaking to the lecturer ask them you know how how can I contextualize this I don't understand the connection of that and that's really important Mm. That's a very good point. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I echo all of that uh, fully, as we all would, uh, most, most, most definitely. It's going back to the idea of the transferable skills again, and as you say, the application, um, in, in, in that sense. But also, um, from our perspective, yes, listening to the feedback as well. And another example we can give is that in terms of the content, we have put certain, um elements as optional, for example, moving forward as well. Um, because while some individuals may feel, oh, this content isn't at the appropriate level for, for me, I've done this, there will be another individual who will feel this is really useful and this is really helping me. And therefore we have, uh, for example, on, on one of the modules um, moving forward, the learning in a digital era, um, where there will be a right, right, wide range of skills amongst those taking the, uh, taking the module included uh, a, a sort of a, an optional element, a zero element if you like, and one can dip in, one can dip out of that, you can choose to totally ignore it. It's not part of the assessment process, it's part of, of, of the building up of the skills, the, in, the, the improving the skills, um, also as, as a means of re going back to something that's something that one wants as a sort of a refresher as well so that, that there's more flexibility um, because as I say we've listened to the feedback and um, 
in those terms as well, as well as removing the origami crane, but also making it clear as to as to the purpose and, and the application of all these exercises, because they were they were they were done um, in terms of the application and why certain certain skills would be of key importance and problem solving is the is the obvious one in that sense. Yeah. Tommy, can I come back in again? Oh, sorry, Rian, did I interrupt you? Yeah. I, I, I was just going to say one further point is that one of the things that we were um, very concerned about is making sure that there were other activities, not just on screen activities as well. So the origami crane was designed as it being a takeaway, not sat in front of the screen. So it was a, an additional practical activity that we tried to include. As you say, it was the one thing that we an anticipated would come up today, but um, it is it is it was one of those things that we put in there to try and develop practical skills, give people an opportunity for off screen time as well. Tommy, if I could just jump in at the end, Eddie, just you know, we are all conscious that uh, the introduction of these modules, you 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 picked up why we're committed to them, why we we wanted them to be introduced uh, with with our students in mind, and I know it's it's, it's caused some some strong feelings, but there is a genuine intention to make sure that we we uh, place our students in the best possible employable context. And I know I'm conscious that I've heard it, it's been shared with us through the students, you know, there's a feeling that students voice hasn't been heard. But there has been consultation and you'll, you'll, you've heard now that there, has been change, there have been changes made. And that was outlined in, I think there was a, a blog shared at Easter and I think perhaps we can revisit that and in the fuller response share with you the full detail, the full gambit of the changes that have been made following uh, listening to the responses of students so, that, so we can evidence and show how we have responded to concerns raised. But I would again pick up on Maggie's point. Please, you know, share with your in real time with your lecturer your feelings so we can we can respond uh, as as appropriate there and then rather than build up some frustrations because people feel that they can't share their concerns. Thank you. Um, I just want to just bring it up again in case we've had any students join us since I last mentioned it, but we've had some technical issues with our Q&A function. So if you'd like to submit some live questions, we have a Mentimeter up and running, which you can access at www.menti.com and use the code 15857798 and you can submit live questions through that. Um, you'll also be able to access that through our social media platforms and stuff because we're sharing it on there for you as well. Again, incredibly sorry about technical difficulties. Um, once again, I'm very conscious of the time, so if we can try and move through the next few themes um, slightly briskly, I do want to make sure that we cover it all as a part of this session. And just to remind colleagues, obviously we have the written responses available for after yes. if we want to add in any more detail and stuff. The, the next thing that we're going to touch on now is around lost content. So I have a couple of examples from different sites. So for our Swansea based art students, they lost a materials module, which they believe is intrinsic to their courses. The Lampeter students um, lost their level five independent project, also known as the mini disc. And these students just want to know why these modules were removed and it's particularly in the case of the level five independent project whether it can be reintroduced into the curriculum for the next academic year. I think Tom, this is the one for Christine and the team I think. Yeah no problem. If that's okay. Okay well I'll take I'll take the independent project um uh, question uh, to begin with, uh, if, 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 if you like as well. Uh, yes, I appreciate there have been uh, comments raised regarding the uh, loss of the independent project. Um, but there again, this also links into how we are listening to the feedback and making uh, changes as a result of, of, of the feedback. Uh, no, the independent uh, project module will not exist as it did exist, most definitely moving forward. Um, but what will exist and what we're looking at, and it's it's not purely for, for Lampeter, it's, it's across the, the module in general, is strengthening the research focus of the um, semester one level, le semester one level five uh, change makers module, the first module, um, and this, as I say, has come through through the student feedback in part, and we want to link it more closely to the independent project uh, at level six, the graduate attribute module, 
And as a result, this will create a more coordinated and more focused approach. Um, and that, as I say, will inevitably be reflected in the assessments. So whilst the module will not be coming back in its in its original form, it will be coming back, if you like, through the changes in these in these modules, uh, whereby there'll be greater opportunities. Um, we've also been looking at at order of modules and changes on on, on those lines. So the that research element is going to link all the way through from levels four to level six. Um, so that's just an example of one of the changes uh, that will that that will occur um, in part, as I say, because of we've listened to the feedback. Excellent. Thank you, Christine. Can I just clarify? Well, I, sorry, sorry, Tammy, I'm conscious that you had a question from Swansea on materials which falls into my area of responsibility. And I'll quickly answer it. Um, it was a decision by the staff uh, as to what would be displaced and what we found was number one that the materials module could be utilized as one of the easiest ones to contextualize within the graduate attributes but more importantly a key feature of the Swansea College of Art is access to workshops and what do they use in the workshops are materials and therefore we felt that during their life in the university they could gain the knowledge that they'd miss out within that module through practical experiments and development of their work within the workshops. And, Thank and you, I Barry. Can I just Sorry, add to Ryan. that? Can I just jump back to Christine just to ask a clarifying question before we move on? Yeah. So with the level five independent project, we can expect to see something of that nature return to the curriculum for next year. No, that isn't what I said, Tammy. What I said was there will be a, a greater focus on the re research elements in relation to and um, the the focus on research linking to um, the change makers modules. All right, thank you. Sorry, Rihanna, I cut across you. That's OK. All I was going to say is I know for the fine art programme, the materials was also um, moved to be part of the uh, materials construction and deconstruction module with a view, as Barry said, that they would be covering materials in the workshops, but that it wasn't completely excluded. It was included in the um, construction and deconstruction module instead. OK, thank you. Um, so the next two questions are slightly more around how the modules are implemented. Firstly, why can't the common modules be removed? And secondly, why can't the common modules be optional or allow student autonomy to choose which modules they're expected to take based on what areas they believe will benefit them? If I, I, have, to, I have to go on, Barry, you go. I'll, I'll defer to you. Sorry, uh, Delanbach. I've got to go back to the fact again, it's our duty to do our best for our students. Uh, if we were to remove them, we would uh, put them at a huge disadvantage. So we have no intention of disadvantaging any of our students. We will therefore, as far as we are concerned, whilst we are informed by government, by employers and by the student body of the requirements for future employment, we will maintain them. So the, I'll, I'll cover that first part. There's no intention of removing them. Making them optional. I would not consider that because once again, it, the status quo could prevail and once again we will be providing them with a disadvantage. And, and just to confirm Tammy, um, it was a, a Senate decision originally which is the decision making body of the university and notwithstanding uh, what we've already outlined, the work that will be ongoing to respond, to improve, to, to fine tune and to respond to, to comments from, from the student body, it was reviewed uh, a Senate meeting this week with all uh, all the, the comments that we were shared in the Students' Union were present there and if the Senate was still firm in the belief that this is the way forward for the university given the strategic aims and the values of the university uh, as I have Glenn and as Barry has said. So, so that's the position uh, at this stage. It has been discussed uh, and, and that's that was uh, the view of, of Senate. And it gives us some confidence. Maggie and I have just been uh, this afternoon, the recipients of an email from uh, the, the head of Maggie's faculty who has been discussing with the health board about internships. And we are putting together a unique graduate internship programme for the health boards. And lo and behold, the first thing they've requested, Maggie, are graduate attributes. 
That's so right. That's completely yeah. independently of any, they've identified <coughs> benefits to them as an employer, to their employees as interns who have these, and that was so welcome uh, an hour or so ago before we entered this meeting, Maggie, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. OK, thank you. Um, we're going to move on to the next theme, which is around the modules relevance. So the most common comparison that we've heard through consultations, through our pre-submission um, and general conversations with students is that they feel like taking a graduate attribute module is like taking a business minor without any recognition in their final degree for completing this content. How is the university going to rectify the lack of specific degree relevance within the modules content? I, th I think, Tammy, before I, I uh, revert back to the uh, development board and um, Christina and colleagues, I think that's where I was going in relation to they shouldn't be seen as separate entities. There's a lot of work being completed to ensure that the, the contextualization is subject specific. Um, and it's not uh, as a history graduate, humanities uh, individual, it is not a business module. They are graduate attributes and they're transferable skills for the future. So I wouldn't pigeonhole them in that way. And having said that, I think we you must consider the way that the subject contextualization does apply within the graduate attributes. So it's, it's, there isn't that separation, as I said earlier. Um, in detail, I don't know whether the colleagues would have come in, but that's the general statement that I would make. Yeah, if, if I didn't come in there, Tammy, um, I think it's it's it, it is the context contextualization that that and also the assessments. I think there's mm -hmm. greater mm -hmm. autonomy being given um, um, as a result um, in uh, there again um, of student feedback and also staff feedback. We've provided greater autonomy uh, in terms of uh, opportunities also for um, staff to input in terms of contextualization into the um, into the online content, uh, into the asynchronous as is known content, uh, as well as into the tutor led sessions as well. And, and, and it's, it's through these assessments that there are real opportunities to focus on your subject area, but also to gain those wider transferable skills in the context of, of, of your subject area. Thank you. Yeah. Do, do you want to mention it, it actually in the final year, the um, the independent project is um, I think almost in, in every single programme throughout the university, there is a form of an independent project so that um, although it's part of the graduate attribute package, as it were, it is no different to what everyone was doing before. What we've just tried to do is provide more options and more material online to support it. So that one is still 40 credits for you to tailor exactly to your specific degree programme. Thank you. Um, just off the back of, of that question, while we're talking around um, the contextualization of the modules, lots of students feel like they're spending a third of their year studying a completely separate subject due to the lack of that contextualization. Will the modules be provided to academic staff who are delivering the content with an appropriate amount of time to ensure that that contextualization is in place for September? Again, that's the development board's answer, but obviously yes would be the answer, but to outline it further, colleagues. Yeah, yeah, I mean, all staff have, um, as we've been taking on student staff feedback, there have been amendments, it's, it's an iterative process. And um, all staff who deliver on them have had access to that a, a portal we've created so they can go in, comment on the material being recreated, being changed and have that constant feedback loop. So they've been involved in the changes as they've been occurring. So yes, um, all staff have access to it um, as it's been ongoing and certainly before so they can contextualise it. Yeah. And what we did, Tommy, in January, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we, it's, it's, a, it's a recorded event and I'm sure you can access it. We actually held an event for those staff, not only those delivering the modules, but more importantly, everybody within the course team to be aware of how they could share their material into the graduate attributes module. So it's beyond the development of just the graduate attributes. 
and uh, again is contextualizing across the whole program and that's what we've tried to engender amongst our teams is that is ownership at the team level to provide that conte contextualization you, you get a sense there tammy of, of when i the reason i was saying that i don't think any other module has, has been so scrutinized and across the university and has such an input across the disciplines uh, as these modules and this package uh, as uh, maggie describes it sorry maggie i interrupted you did i no i was just going to say in fact um we i mean the students won't be aware of this but um we have a, an all staff conference um towards the end of the academic year where staff show talk about what they've been doing best practice that type of thing and actually um it's a two-day event and um one day is going to be dedicated to these graduate attributes, what staff have done, sharing good practice. So it's an ongoing process of learning for our staff as well. So when they come back in September and start delivering again, it, they've got, just like you, they are more up to date, they've got more contextualization, they're learning from each other to make everything, because we're, we're very conscious that just like what we're, what we're saying to students, you know, we have to, you have to be developed, you have to understand what the common, what the um what is current so do our staff and we're very keen that all our staff participate in that so they also understand what's current and then can help you with that within the graduate attribute thank you i'm just going to jump in here because we've had a question through from our live submission uh, the staff keeps saying that the graduate attribute modules are contextualized in our subjects but myself and most students i've spoken to feel that isn't true at all well I, i'm sorry I to hear that and, and and that is not the intention and that's not what should be the case so we 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 would need to investigate that and know more about that situation but as you as we've shared with you uh, the assessments and work done by the development board has to ensure that that is, that contextualization is there so i'm disappointed to hear that but we need to address it if that's the case thank you um again i'm conscious of time so we're going to move on to the next theme uh, which is around the weighting of modules. Many students have expressed concern that the graduate attribute modules are too heavily weighted, equating to a third of their overall degree. What is the capacity to reduce the weighting in of the modules in that space? Uh, again, uh, it was discussed uh, uh, amongst colleagues and, and the decision is to keep them at the level they are at the moment. And, I, and again, as Barry said, I, I feel I'm repeating myself, but conscious of your the previous open question that came they are contextualized as well so it's so they, they willing they should and the, the the plan is and and the the preparation is for them to include that subject specific so i think there is a a, a strong feeling that, that that they will remain as as they are thank you on the back of that uh we had another submission that states other institutions offer courses with employability skills similarly to what's covered in the graduate attribute modules but their skills content doesn't have <clears throat> excuse me a credit value attached so why has EWTSD adopted this approach when we have specific degree content being replaced I think in general terms because as Barry says we placed strong value on these graduate employability uh, skills and these graduate attributes and these skills, as I explained as a previous employer and as you heard before, I think not to do so, not to give the credit value would undermine the importance of these skills, these transferable skills mm -hmm. for the future. Um, and I, you know, I was go far as to say subject content is important, graduate attribute skills are important. Without each other, they are not very important. They are, they, 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 um, they benefit each other and they go together. And I think moving forward, there'll be even more emphasis on personal and transferable skills than there has been in the past, would be my opinion on that at least. And this was something we discussed at the early development stage and we did react to employer feedback. Um, we could have offered it uh, as extracurricular, but I've already answered a question when I, when I answered the fact that it could be optional. The employers were telling us the content of the attributes is what <coughs> they want. And they wanted it credit valued so that's where we came from on that basis the importance of the employer to recognize and for our students to be recognized for their achievement just to, just to 
refine a bit what I said, it's the application of the knowledge that you have is crucial moving forward. That's what I was trying to say. No worries. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, we're going to move on to the next theme. Um, again, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. This theme is around feedback this year. So from the consultations I've personally been a part of, there have been issues that affect the university as a whole and all of the students taking these um, this content, but also um, campus specific impacts that students believe should be addressed. Is feedback from students being considered by an individual campus basis or as a wider institution? Colleagues, I think both um, we give value to all the consultations and yourselves as student union colleagues will be aware of that, but I perhaps the detail uh, I can transfer to colleagues, but it is important that we we take all into consideration, both the campus and the general view of students as well, because they will differ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can only uh, sort of agree with that in the sense that that is what we do, that is what we do. We look at we we look at look at both um, in the in. Um, I mean, much of the focus is on the, the graduate attributes in general. There may be some subject specific things that come through as well, but those are those are considered and they're also considered by the discipline areas as well as the as and when they come through. And, and if so if, if in detail they were, they, we've had specific responses and we've undertaken specific responses uh, according to campus um, requests and camp campus specific um, consultation as well and, and colleagues in in Lampeter for instance would be aware of how we responded to ensure that there were a number of additional groups to make sure that we responded to the specific response coming from from that campus just as an example thank you the next question is around the kinds of feedback that you've received. So students are wanting to know, have there been instances of really positive feedback around the graduate attribute modules? And if so, which campuses specifically are having success with these modules? And how is it impacting um, the issues in the other campuses being addressed and setting precedent of best practice? Could I suggest that, uh, Rian, I know we've, we've got some recorded evidence of um, positive uh, feedback and then I'll open up then, uh, as you're aware, the Nexus event will be a, a means, a further means post our January event of how we cascade that from campus to campus. But Rian, perhaps would you like, you'd like to illustrate the, the, the positive response we had? As yes. An yeah, absolutely. We've had quite a number of um, emails from students actually um, documenting how helpful they find the modules, how they have helped them to understand their own skills and what they need to strengthen. And that um, it's uh, certainly, for example, we've got an apprentice student who has undertaken um, one of these modules and he's directly applied it into his apprenticeship role and it's significantly improved his, his abilities that he's looking for promotion. That I think it, it really has helped our students, but that's not just um, one student, one area. We have had positive comments like we um, for our institute, we are based on Swansea, uh, Carmarthen and Cardiff. And we have had positive comments across the board. It isn't specific to just Swansea students or just Carmarthen students. There has been feedback from all. Thank you. Um, the last question on the theme of feedback is what proactive steps are the university taking to ensure that the feedback loop is closed and that students feel heard and that their feedback will and is being actioned? I think going back to my, my previous comment, we, we will share with you how we've responded. I think we did so in, in or Christine did so on our behalf in, in the blog. And I think it's important that you just don't hear us saying so uh, on this event. We actually share that with you so we can document the changes that we've made and we can evidence those. So we're not just saying it, we are doing it as well. And my colleagues have done it. So we, we'll do that to make sure um, that you're aware. But I, I wouldn't say that the the communication loop is closed in the sense we will continue to discuss and continue to listen. So it's not just one process. We've responded to the requests and the um, responses and the feedback this year, but we'll continue to ask the questions as we do in any way, which is good practice in whatever field 
you, you are involved in, you continually ask yourself, how can I do this better? And we shall do so the same. Yeah, I mean, the very nature of these modules, they're about contemporary challenges. Mm. So we have to keep um, making sure that they are contemporary. Otherwise, <coughs> we wouldn't be doing anyone um, a service. So, yeah, constantly the feedback is a complete, it's a virtuous cycle all the time. We want feedback from every source to consistently mm. improve, to add in, change the modules so that they constantly are contemporary. Mm. Thank you. We have a few questions um, that are going to make up the closing remarks portion of our session today. Um, the first one is the impact of COVID on students across the country can't be overstated, but the impact of drastic changes to our curriculum has been a source of significant stress for a large portion of our student body, and this has resulted in well-being repercussions. What will the university do to proactively reduce this going forward? I'd like to think that today is part of that process. Um, we're disappointed, obviously, um, that we have created well-being issues. I therefore, it is incumbent upon us now to work with our staff in order to uh, help and maintain that flow of information as to why, uh, and the why being the importance of these for the for our students' future. And I think that's the most important thing arising from today is to maintain that communication stream um, to get everybody engaged, you know, pulling in the same direction. Thank you, Barry. Yeah. Sorry, Dylan, did you want to? No, I just agree. And, and obviously, um, we, as part of that process, we, we will work with colleagues who are involved in well-being and student well-being to ensure that we uh, are doing our utmost to support uh, students in that process absolutely it is crucial thank you the next question kind of ties in with that so taking into account um the vast discrepancy between the positive feedback and complaints that have been made around how these modules have integrated into the wider degree schemes and the level of dysfunction that we've seen from some of the feedback of many of our students Will the format of these modules change? The content is an, uh, continually been evaluated um, and I don't wish to come into a situation of, of comparison, but you know, at the end of the day, we've, we've spoken today about two extremes, the concerns and the positive, but in between those two, you've probably got 80% who are remaining silent and getting on and seeing the benefit of it. You know, when we're looking at the situation here, we will continuously review. There's a significant development team on here, a significant development team who are developing material for use in other universities. I can share that with you now because others have now realized the significance of what we are uh, achieving here. Thank you. Yes, and, and just to reaffirm my earlier point, we will share with you what changes have been made, and I think that was done already in the Easter blog, and they, they vary from you know, the question is too many forums, too many blog posts. We've addressed that, the assessments, the diversity and inclusion elements. There's a wide range of elements which we've we've looked at, we reviewed. Well, I say we, the team has worked on this to make sure that we continuously respond. So, and that, as Barry noted, will involve staff as well. And as part of this conference, this Nexus conference, to make sure that all staff are aware of the changes that have been made and the best practice across universities. So we can all learn from each other. Thank you. Um, the last question that I have for you today before we conclude the session is uh, what are your plans surrounding the options for next year and how will this look in September? Colleagues, I don't know. My options, I'm not sure what, what that refers to, if I'm honest. I don't know whether colleagues have a better view. We've identified in Senate uh, and ratified in Senate that the, the current credit attributes um, notwithstanding their development will continue next year. Um, naturally, every program um, will go up through a cycle of review. Those have been reviewed for the 21 delivery. Will that be identified to students um, on a program by program basis? But in, in dialogue regarding um, the graduate attributes, they will continue in their current form and credit value. 
Thank you. Sorry, Dylan, was there something else you wanted to say? No, no, if, if, as you said, if any of these answers are not answering the question, uh, obviously we'll follow up with, with written answers so, so that we can make sure that we do answer the questions appropriately and, and in full. Brilliant, thank you. So we're going to wrap up the session here. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of the students that were involved in today's event. Mm. Every mm. student who submitted a question, mm. both through the live event today, yes. given all of our technical problems, mm. and through our pre-submission form. And thank you to the staff that have made time to join us today. Um, we are keeping the mentee submission open um, past the end of this session. So it will give you a chance to kind of submit questions based on the responses today. That's going to be open till five. You can access that once again through www.menti.com with the code 15857798. And those questions will be added to the list of questions that's the full list of questions that are sent to the staff for written response. That question list will also include anything that we didn't get a chance to cover during the session today from the pre-submission. So all of your questions will have a response. Aside from that, please take care. If you have any questions or want to follow up on anything that was discussed today, please email union at uwtsd.ac.uk. Tommy, can, can I also take this opportunity on behalf of the staff to thank you and mm -hmm. um, for facilitating this. I think it's an important event and, and I find it beneficial and also to the students of Pro's question as well. I think it's it's part of the dialogue and mm. look forward to continue the conversation. So thank you for your time and thank you for arranging this this session. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah. No problem. Well,